of us. Our ancestors crossed mountain ranges, sailed open oceans to map new lands, and sought out the unknown while always looking to the stars. We're curious, and now we're at a place where we can pioneer new horizons. Because of Earth, this blue planet, and all its beauty is just our starting place. It's time to go again. Four. Amanda, start. Two. Blue. One. of space to all and lay the way for generations to come. When our descendants look to the stars, perhaps from a rocky moon or colonies floating in open space, they'll remember this time. When they reflect on where it started, they'll remember this place. And when they honor those first explorers who said, let's go, they'll remember these bold steps. We are of blue origin. And this is just the beginning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Shepherd's 23rd mission. Thanks for joining us. I'm Erica Wagner, coming to you from our headquarters in Seattle, Washington. Our launch team is down in West Texas, preparing New Shepard for flight. This mission is dedicated to payloads. We have 36 on board, as well as tens of thousands of postcards from Club for the Future, Blue Origins nonprofit. There are no people on board today. This is the fourth flight for the New Shepard program this year, the 23rd New Shepard flight since the program began, and the first dedicated payload flight since NS-17 in August of 2021. The vehicle on the pad this morning is dedicated to payload missions, and it's the ninth flight for this particular rocket. 18 of the payloads on this flight are funded by NASA primarily through the NASA Flight Opportunities Program, who have been a great partner for us in testing a wide range of space technologies. These payloads are helping prepare important capabilities for our future of living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. Now, one of the most important aspects about New Shepard is that it can conduct many kinds of missions, from astronaut flights to research to creating novel kinds of art and media. Including today's flight, the total number of commercial payloads flown on New Shepard is now more than 150. New Shepard offers access to space, where timelines for researchers to prepare are measured in weeks to months, not months to years. And this sort of regular access allows them to collect their preliminary data quickly, to tune their systems, and to reduce risk for longer missions. Several of the payloads on today's flight are supporting lunar technology development. One of them is Infinity Fuel Cell's AMPS experiment, which aims to demonstrate the operation of hydrogen fuel cell technology in microgravity. Now, hydrogen fuel cells are pretty neat. We can break down water into hydrogen and oxygen and then use an electrochemical reaction to extract the energy from these molecules. Fuel cells can cleanly power a wide range of systems, producing only heat and water as byproducts. Infinity is collaborating with NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston to develop these flexible power systems, which will reduce costs and improve reliability. Someday they may even be used to help power lunar rovers or habitats. On our last two payload flights, we flew the Deorbit Descent and Landing Sensor Demonstration, or DDL, exposed on the outside of the New Shepard booster. This payload tested a suite of sensors for high accuracy landing on future moon missions using a terrain relative navigation technology. Today, two more payloads will future payload missions after we separate the capsule from the booster. We'll use small reaction control thrusters to gently spin up the whole vehicle like a slow centrifuge. That spinning will produce centripetal accelerations equal to about one sixth of Earth's gravity, mimicking the environment 
of the lunar surface. New Shepard is quickly becoming a go-to vehicle for flying NASA-funded lunar-related technologies to enable a sustainable return to the moon. Speaking of science, earlier this year, our friends at the International Space Station, the ISS, achieved an extraordinary milestone of over one million hours of total research. A big congratulations to NASA and all the scientists who have contributed to this incredible body of work. I'm just gonna call out that we are in a hold and you can see that in the upper right hand of your screen. So let's go check in with the rocket. Back on mic. We are currently in a hold while Mission Control makes sure all systems and weather are go. While we wait, there's so much going on at Blue Origin and so much more planned for the future. Here's a look at many of the things we're doing all across Team Blue. Getting to space more affordably and safely is important for the future of the planet. I wanted to be a part of the generation that actually moved more than just a few astronauts off the face of the Earth. We want to make history. I want, I mean, I want to be a part of it. This is bigger than all of us. It's not just a job. It's something that hopefully will leave a legacy for all of us. Good evening from Launch Site 1 near Van Horn, Texas, where tomorrow morning, Amazon founder and now executive chair, Jeff Bezos. He and his three fellow passengers are set to make history on Blue Origin's first passenger flight to space. We've been talking about the first human flight ever since I arrived at Blue. Step by step, ferociously is our motto, and now it's actually happening. The highlight for me was as the crew was re-entering the atmosphere, and they were hooting and hollering, and they were like, Capcom! You've got an incredibly happy crew in here. Guys, that was incredible. Chloe, that was incredible. <laughs> Our next challenge for New Shepard is not just having one human flight capable vehicle set, it's having two, three, four, five, six. We're looking at how to expand this into a fleet of vehicles that can fly at such cadence that we're able to put so many more astronauts into space. This is nuts! 
took the first huge step with human flight on New Shepard, and New Glenn is going to be the next huge step for Blue Origin. So in the last calendar year, it's really outstanding what this team has been able to accomplish, even in the face of COVID. There may be multiple facilities, but we're one factory trying to achieve a common goal, and that goal really is about making Blue Origin the very best and putting people into space. New Glenn is just at the heart of everything. It's the big rocket, it's the workhorse, it's the thing that has to be in place before all these other exciting things are gonna happen. This thing's massive. I mean, you know, you look at it compared to Saturn V, it's not too not too far off. And it's, it's modern, it's reusable, it's new hardware that's gonna be changing the game and it's gonna be the next generation of launch vehicle. New Glenn is built, launched, landed, and recovered here. This complex has the ability to do everything required to deliver an all-up stage for flight. The raw stock comes in the south end of the building and a rocket goes out the north. And then 10 miles to our east is our launch complex 36 where we actually launch the New Glenn booster. We took a lot of lessons learned from the New Shepard program and built them into our designs here at LC36. Given the size and, and power of New Glenn, we had to build all brand new construction. We couldn't build on somebody else's old launch site because the thrust of our engines, the size of our rockets, I mean, we had to build everything brand new, which is what we did. It's taken over 400 people on site and four years of construction to get to where we're at today with the construction of the launch pad. Everything out here at LC36 is big, it's heavy, and that's because what we're getting ready to launch is big and heavy. I've never seen a company that's been developing so many engines all at the same time. And for a person who's a rocket engine nerd, <laughs> I absolutely love Blue for that. Here at Zeeks, we test the BE-4 engine. At Geeks, they test BE-3PM, which is our new Shepard propulsion module engine, and also BE-3U, which is the upper stage variant for New Glenn. On the BE-4 test program, we've actually conducted over 10,000 seconds of 100% power testing. When the test goes off, you can feel it. You can feel it in your heart, in your bones. There's a sort of silent energy. It's like electricity in that room. When you watch that engine fire, when you feel it through two sets of hearing protection, you feel it resonate in your body. It is just pure, raw energy. Your body is a part of that resonance in the air and those vibrations. There is just nothing like seeing a full power engine test. The amount of energy that comes out of it and just recognizing how much engineering and manufacturing and and quality expertise it takes to put an engine together, get it on a test stand, and have that all system work together. It's just a huge team effort, and it's really exciting to see an engine test. Build a roll to space means that we're not working on just one thing. We're working on a legacy. Orbital Reef will provide an open architecture with unlimited growth potential to accommodate and stimulate new types of businesses in space. It's the commercial world in which advanced capabilities get normalized and become a part of everyday life. We like to say uh, our job is to build the infrastructure that will enable millions of people to live and work in space to benefit the Earth. If you're going to have millions, first you have to have thousands. Before thousands, you have to have dozens. We always say that we're a company that builds rockets, and in order to be the best company we can be, we need to create that environment where people feel like they can be their best selves. I've dedicated my entire life to space because this is the future. Everything that Blue Origin wants to do is on behalf of humanity. One of the things that we have to do is inspire young people to build the future of life in space. So Blue started the Club for the Future. We ask K-12 students to send us postcards with their dreams of the future. And then we send those postcards to space and New Shepard. It's my generation's job to build the road to space so that the future generations can unleash their creativity. I'm Jerry Gleckel. I'm Emery Coles. Justin White. Sandy Lee. Dave Powell. Allison Crone. Meg Dalton Hoffman. I'm Jennifer Oldham, and I'm building a road to space. 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 I'm building a road to space.
so much cool stuff going on across all of Blue Origin. We are looking for great people across a wide range of disciplines and specialties to join Team Blue. If you're interested in joining our team, please visit our website for more details. Okay, I see that we're continuing in our hold. Let's go check out what's going on out at the pad. We're currently in a hold while Mission Control makes sure all systems and weather are aligned. We anticipate this will take a couple of minutes. As we've said time and time again, our long-term vision here at Blue Origin is millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. It's a big goal, and to get there, we're going to need future generations to help us along the way. Because, well, Earth is Earth. It's the best planet. There's everything you need. Earth is perfect for us because it has enough water and it's got plants and trees. Our atmosphere is the only one that has oxygen enough for all of us to be able to breathe. Humans, animals, grass. It's just, just very peaceful. Yeah, the air. We don't have to wear a spacesuit. You could try riding a bike in space, but you'd probably fail. We need to save this planet, because as far as we know, it's the only one we've got. Space might just be our future. Earth is running out of energy, but space has limitless resources. We can use all those without impacting the environment here on Earth. The sun is in space. What if we're just closer to them? There's all this space in space to put solar panels. We could harvest a lot of energy from the sun where there's more light coming. I am guessing like 10 million to power the whole entire world. One day we'll put factories in space. 
cars, phones, paper, toilet paper, toilet, <laughs> clothes, shoes, beds. They all came from factories. We can move everything that pollutes Earth into space. It would still be possible to live on Earth, but we'd get most of our supplies from outer space. A new Shepard rocket is reusable. Launch, land, repeat. Launch, land, repeat. It lands back on the ground and it doesn't get dumped into the ocean. The only thing you need to every flight is the fuel. Liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen and like liquid hydrogen. Those elements are basically water. Mix them together, they're water. Rockets that use clean fuel, such as water, are way better for Earth. By going to space, we can help preserve the natural world by just, you know, letting it take a break from humans. Maybe instead of there being a junkyard, maybe there would be a playground. Earth can have zoos and gardens and basically is a huge national park. We should definitely keep Yellowstone National Park on Earth. You can't move geysers into space. Anything can happen in space. Like, I mean, Pluto. <laughs> When my generation grows up, we're gonna use space to protect Earth. I'm very excited about the future. Very excited about the future indeed. So thankful for all the kids that are joining us in the work that we do with Club for the Future and Blue Origin. We are continuing to hold in this morning in West Texas. So let's go back out and check out how things are going at the rocket. We're currently in a hold while Mission Control makes sure all systems and weather are go. While we have a moment, let's talk about how the new Shepard operation uses holds. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us today on what is a very busy day, but also a very busy week. You are our flight director for the New Shepard 20th mission, but you also have a very impressive background. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to Blue? Yeah, absolutely, Jackie. I'm an engineer by training, but uh, I joined NASA as an astronaut in the late 1990s and uh, flew on two space shuttle missions to help construct the International Space Station, um, including doing three spacewalks on the second mission. Wow. Um, that was a lot of fun. I did that for about 15 Safe years. To say, that's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then I decided that what I really wanted to do uh, for the next step in my career was come and take that knowledge, the lessons I'd learned at NASA, and help build a road to space here at Blue Origin. All right, Nicholas, tell us a little bit about how the launch windows differ here for our new Shepard missions versus something like a space shuttle mission. They're, they're quite different, Jackie. Um, when we were flying the space shuttle, we had to launch within a very narrow window in order to dock with the space station that was flying overhead at 
17,500 miles an hour. You can imagine if you're going to dock with a space station, you really only have a couple of minutes either side of the nominal launch time. And if you wait much longer than that, the space station's gone. Well, here at Blue Origin, we're flying a suborbital vehicle that doesn't have to dock with anything. So our launch window can be much longer. And in fact, that window is typically defined by sunrise in the morning and then by uh, temperatures becoming, uh, say, too hot in the desert uh, mid-morning or afternoon or perhaps uh, the GPS satellite constellation availability or something else like that. But our windows are typically um, a, a couple of hours long. Got it. And another difference between the two is the approach to holds during mm -hmm. the clock. How does that work for New Shepard? That's really a, a choice rather than something that's forced upon us by the physics of launching. Uh, NASA and several launch vehicles use planned holds. And those are times when the automated sequences, the clock as it were, can stop running and the human activities can catch up or can, can take place without being constrained by a clock. So, for example, we used a hold at NASA to load astronauts. That's something that might take uh, an hour. It might take an hour and a half, and a hold is a great place to put that. Uh, here at Blue Origin, we decided to take a different path. We decided to build the time we need into the clock schedule so that we could leave the clock running, for example, during astronaut load. And that's what we do. So you'll notice that uh, when, uh, in the normal course of events, our clock never, never stops. But we have the ability to use holds now, of course, to wait for improvements in the weather, for example, or to wait for an aircraft to fly off the range if we have uh, a red range, or to deal with any issues that our flight controls bring up to us. So another difference between the New Shepard mission and, say, a space shuttle mission are our approaches to hold when we're mm -hmm. in the countdown clock. How does holding differ? Tell us a little bit about that. Holding is quite different here at Blue Origin. At NASA, uh, we traditionally used holds uh, during, say, the shuttle launch to allow the non-computer controlled um, parts of the launch preparation to be done without the clock running. So we would halt the clock, the sequence of automated events in the launch countdown, um, to do things like load astronauts. And then we could let that happen without the clock ticking um, safely and, and, then, and then restart the clock and, and count down the remaining time to launch. Because the choice to use launch uh, holds is not driven by the physics of launching, like, for example, the launch window is, we were able to choose a different approach at Blue. We tried out this approach of having no holds, of building additional time into the procedure while the clock is running so that people who don't have a task can wait while others who have a task can continue to run it to the clock. Um, that, we think, has worked quite well. It's been helpful in some ways. We do have the ability to call holds whenever we need them, for example, to wait for winds uh, to improve or for clouds to move out of the range. Um, we also, of course, uh, encourage anybody on the launch team to call a hold whenever they have a safety issue that they'd like to raise, and that hold then gives us time to really examine it in depth, to address it, and decide whether we're good to proceed, whether we need to change a procedure a bit, or whether we're going to scrub. Well, thank you so much for those behind the scenes insights, super informational. And that was New Shepard Flight Director Nick Patrick sitting down with Jackie Cortese talking about planned holds, unplanned holds, what they are, how we're using them by the team on launch days. Let's go back out to the rocket and see how things are going with New Shepard.
while we have a moment, let's talk some more about safety. Safety drives everything we do at Blue Origin. There's nobody on Team Blue who does a better job talking about this than Blue Origin's Director of Systems Safety Engineering, Andrew Lake. Andrew, you have such an important role at Blue Origin. So at Blue, when we say safety is a top priority, what does that mean? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, this idea of safety as a priority. And there are a lot of ways to think about this, but I see safety more as a core value that you build a business around. And a business like what we were thinking about for New Shepherd and what Blue is doing in general um, is animated around this idea of safe and reliable systems. So New Shepherd went through this extensive test program, right? And we flew for, what, five, six years before we put people on yep. board. Are we, how do you know that you're done? In, in a certain sense. Instilling safety into both the vehicle and the, the how it operates. Yeah, the, the, there are a couple of ways you kind of go about it. The first thing you have to do is you have to set goals, um, safety performance goals, safety performance thresholds, to help you understand when you've met those thresholds. But in any program, you're never really done. You always want to look for opportunities to improve the system, um, both operationally, both for safety, both for reliability as well. And so we always have to maintain a, a humility that comes with flying rockets with these kinds of energies involved. And so we and, and the ops team that we're about to go fly this mission, I've never seen a team more diligent, um, more patient, and the constant awareness and the vigilance required to say raise issues and make sure they're addressed before we decide that it's time to fly people. It's taken a, a team of people to, to get to this point, to be flying people on New Shepard. What would you say to this team? I, I'm humbled to work with this team. Um, it, it would be lying to say that three people who happen to have voted uh, as part of a much larger tech for human flight certification, the people who decided that we're safe enough, hundreds of people have put their blood, sweat, and tears into this program, each of them um, just immensely individually focused on not just the safety of the system, but the reliability of the system. Um, and, and, and then there is the work that our team does to kind of partner with them to, to help them achieve these goals. Um, I, am, I am immensely grateful for the opportunity to work with them, um, and I'm humbled to, to have an opportunity to kind of lead the safety mission assurance efforts with this team. Well, tell me this. Would you fly a new Shepard? I would. Ab and let me just say this. Yeah. There are a lot of people at Blue that would be excited to fly New Shepard, and I'm happy to count myself as one of them. Um, it's a fantastic system. It's a very robust system. And yeah, if I ever had the opportunity to fly, I'll wink a little bit at the <laughs> folks making these decisions. I'd be <laughs> super excited. Fantastic. Well, I hope we get to go one day. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Always a pleasure hearing from Andrew Lake. Really, all of Team Blue is all about mission safety, mission success. So we're taking a, a look at everything today, making sure our parameters are all within the nominal ranges before we launch. Let's go check out how things are looking out at the pad. and the hold has been cleared. So we are back to talking about science. Now here at Blue Origin, we are so excited about all of these payload missions and also about building on this legacy with our new commercial space station, Orbital Reef, now in development with our partners at Sierra Space. We're really looking forward to taking so many of the payloads and astronauts we're now flying on New Shepard even higher later in this decade. 
check out orbitalreef.com for more details. In West Texas, we are now at T-minus 14 minutes, so let's go check in with the rocket. If you're just joining us, welcome. We are at about T minus 13 minutes and 30 seconds until New Shepard launches 36 payloads and tens of thousands of Club for the Future postcards to space and back. Now, New Shepard was built from day one to fly humans to space. In addition to the research we're seeing today, the team worked relentlessly to build in redundant safety systems, reliability, operability into every aspect of the design so we can open those doors to space wider than ever before. In just the last year, we've flown 31 people above the Kármán line across six human flights. Now, this includes seven awesome women who really inspire me. We call them the women in blue. With fewer than 100 women that have ever traveled to space, I really love the way these folks are inspiring girls and women all around the world. Soon we'll be opening up New Shepard to human-tended research flights. Now this means that scientists will get the opportunity to fly to space with their science. I'm thrilled about the ways this is going to change the game for professional researchers, both in terms of the quality and the types of science they'll be able to do. It's kind of like moving from an everyday driver to a professional race car driver. These folks are incredible at what they do, and having them fly with their research will bring their work to new heights, literally. Now, my own background is in bioastronautics or space medicine. So I'm also super excited about what we can learn about the way everyday astronauts' bodies respond to space. Commercial missions like New Shepard are offering us a much larger, much more diverse set of flyers to learn about this important area. Today, we have more than two dozen payloads on board from elementary, middle, and high school classrooms, as well as university-led programs, engaging an entire community of students around the globe. Shout out to all the classrooms and student clubs watching the live stream today. In fact, students from Neo City Academy in Kissimmee, Florida have two payloads on board today. I see they're watching with us live now from the academy. Hey y'all, nice to see you. Fantastic. Love that enthusiasm. One of the Neo City payloads is called Wings of Steel, and that experiment will test the effects of gravity on ultrasonic sound waves. At Blue Origin, we believe inspiring the next generation is essential to achieving our vision of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. This is a goal that will take more than my generation. It'll take many future generations, too. It's why we founded our STEM-focused nonprofit Club for the Future, to inspire students to pursue careers related to science, technology, engineering, and math. Payloads, like many of the ones on board New Shepard today, provide students as young as elementary school the opportunity to learn STEM skills, like coding, testing, and CAD design. Many of these skills are often not taught until college, but here we see students from all around the world now able to design, build, and launch their dreams into space. In addition to all the science and research on board, today's mission is carrying tens of thousands of postcards to space and back on behalf of Club for the Future. The club's Postcards to Space program gives students access to space on Blue Origin's rockets. Now the postcards on this mission come from 19 Club for the Future grant recipients and their partners, including Guayaquil Space Society in Ecuador, students who participated in the STEM NOLA and Kenner Planetarium events in New Orleans, and schools all across the state of Kentucky. Some of the postcards also come from the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where Club for the Future recently installed a new post box to space. If you're in Huntsville for a space camp or a visit to the museum, drop your postcard in the box and have it included on a future mission. Each postcard on board will get flown to the Kármán line and back, and then returned to its creator, stamped flown to space. When I see an eight-year-old holding a piece of art that she just sent to space, it really does feel like anything is possible. So thank you, Club, for helping to inspire. 
to our long-term vision of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth, reusing vehicles and turning them around quickly is essential to reducing the cost of access to space. Imagine if you had to buy a new car every time you drove across town. Travel would be incredibly expensive. So we work towards operational reusability, bringing down the cost of flight. In fact, 99% of New Shepard's dry mass is reused. Everything from the crew capsule and the booster to the ring fin, the engines, and the parachutes. New Shepard's vehicles are currently designed for 25 uses, but we're striving to quadruple that number over time. Okay, we're just under T minus eight and a half minutes until launch. Let's pause for a moment here as we wait for the go, no go poll for mission control, which should be happening any minute now. I'm on. Okay. Okay, we've just heard from Mission Control that we are go for launch. I know there's a bunch of excited students, scientists, and researchers across the globe right now. Let's take a closer look at some of their payloads. The first one is from the University of Florida. The payload is called Biological Imaging in support of suborbital science, or BIS for short. This team uses an enhanced flex fluorescent imaging system to enable a more precise understanding of how plants experience the trip to space. High resolution visualization tracks chemical signals moving through the plant's leaves and stems during flight. These chemical signals modify gene expression during the flight, which is then evaluated by collecting plant samples immediately after landing. Here you see the principal investigators, Dr. Rob Furl and Dr. Annalisa Paul, at work in the field following our last payload mission. Dr. Furl and Dr. Paul have flown payloads on five New Shepard flights, dating all the way back to the vehicle's seventh mission. Welcome back to the University of Florida's Space Plants team. Another payload on board today is called Wax Casting. This comes to us from the MIT Media Lab under the leadership of Dr. Danielle Wood. MIT is going to be testing how cleaner solid rocket motor propellants, such as paraffin and beeswax, can be fabricated in space. Many traditional space fuels are harmful to people and the environment. Wax is affordable and non-toxic. The goal of this experiment is to visualize what happens when two liquids are rotated in microgravity to understand how wax forms into fuel grains. Now these grains could be effective in hybrid propulsion systems on future spacecraft. The T2 experiment from Titan Space Technologies, a new startup in the commercial space market, will use advanced AI to capture suborbital data from multiple sensors and analyze the results in real time. The company's co-founder, Ashley Pilipshin, was the former technical director at OpenAI, one of the world's leading AI research companies. Her expertise will be hard at work today. The T2 results will help Titan advance the development of their AI-powered platform for space experimentation. Impressively, Titan designed and executed this payload in fewer than 60 days. Just goes to show what's possible on commercial suborbital flight systems. All around, there's cutting edge science and technology on board today. Best wishes to all of our payload teams. We know how much you're looking forward to digging into that data from today's space flight. We are at a little less than T minus five minutes until launch. New Shepard is looking ready to go on the pad. If you're just joining us, we are minutes away from launch. 
Here's the flight profile for the New Shepard vehicle. Starting at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds is when we enter into auto sequence. This is when the team in mission control essentially becomes hands off, the vehicle becomes autonomous. The countdown to engine ignition is at T minus zero, followed by throttle up, and the vehicle lifts off the launch pad to begin its journey. Around one minute into flight, we reach max Q. That's where the vehicle experiences its maximum dynamic pressure from the atmosphere. New Shepard will throttle back the engine as it passes through this point. After about two minutes, the BE-3 engine shuts down and we reach MECO, or max main engine cutoff. At this moment, the payloads on board will begin to measure microgravity. This is followed shortly after, at about two and a half minutes, by separation of the capsule, pushed gently away from the top of the booster as it makes its way to apogee, the highest point in the flight. Now we're in free fall and the payloads are in full swing until the vehicle begins to encounter the atmosphere once again. Apogee for both the capsule and the booster happens around four minutes into flight. As the booster begins to descend and re-enter the atmosphere, its fins will deploy to help guide and steer it back to the landing pad. The drag brakes deploy, increasing the rocket's surface area and slowing it down. The BE-3 engine then restarts, really decreasing the speed to just a soft hover as it finds its mark over the landing pad. Its landing legs deploy and it will gently set down. Back to the capsule, it's much slower to re-enter due to its shape. As the capsule makes its way back into the atmosphere, drogue chutes deploy, followed by the mains. These parachutes are reefed, or gathered in, and slowly released to help reduce the loads on the vehicle. Just before touchdown, the capsule landing systems will engage, sensing the distance above the ground and firing that terminal decelerator system, which kicks up a big poof of dust in the West Texas desert and slows the capsule down for a soft landing. Okay, I see that we are in a hold. We're gonna to toss it back to the rocket on the pad. As you see in the upper right corner of your screen, we're currently in a hold while Mission Control makes sure all systems and weather are go for launch. 
We anticipate this will take a few more minutes. Weather plays a key role in our decision making at Launch Site 1. Here's a look at how our launch team factors in the often variable West Texas weather. On a launch day, we give several go-no-go recommendations based on how the forecasts evolve throughout the morning. You have subject matter experts in every subsystem sitting in front of their consoles, intently monitoring everything going on to make sure that the astronauts are launched safely. My name is Andrew Kellenbeck. I'm a guidance navigation and control engineer. My name is Sean Hansen. I'm the launch weather officer for New Shepard. If you're looking for sunny conditions and lack of precipitation, West Texas is one of the best places in the United States that you can have. But we want to verify the weather at the time we have a phase in the launch. So we'll send a balloon up. Weather balloon is one of the best meteorological tools that we have. It provides us instantaneous data of what's going on in the atmosphere all the way up to 80,000 feet. The guidance and control team under Shepard has decades worth of atmospheric and wind forecasting data uh, that we've collected ourselves over the years through the release of radioson balloons that Sean was discussing uh, and also from uh, our government commercial weather data sources. We're now able to predict the capsule landing location to about a half square mile, and this is over a 25 plus square mile landing area. That is very, very accurate. The winds, of course, pose an issue for the capsule in terms of where it will end up landing, but it's also a huge factor in the booster landing performance. A lot of times we see wind shears during the final descent of the booster that cause it to uh, have to readjust its position just prior to touchdown. Uh, so we're looking very closely at the winds at the lower altitudes to make sure the booster can accommodate those changes. The best part of working at Blue is having the opportunity to be a part of something special. And just watching these amazing people uh, put this whole sequence together and get a rocket off the ground it makes me really excited to be a part of it. My favorite part of working at Blue is uh, the opportunity to work on something that is far greater than myself, but that will last generations, and really making an impact on the, the history and future of human spaceflight. So much attention to detail being paid by this incredible team here in West Texas. We're gonna go back and check on what's going on out at the pad. want to ensure everything is ready for today's mission for all these payloads on board. While we have a moment, many of the team members who make our new Shepherd program possible also serve as ambassadors for Club for the Future. 
Blue Origin's STEM-focused nonprofit. One of them is Roxy Schneider. She oversees New Shepard's maintenance program. Roxy recently answered a question from Javier Miranda in Lexington, Kentucky. Here's the next Q for Blue. Hi, my name is Javier Miranda. I go to Bryan Station Middle School. I live in Lexington, Kentucky. And my question is, how many times can you reuse a rocket? Thank you. Oh man, that's a great question, Javier. Great question. Um, I'm Roxy Schneider from the New Shepard Ops and Maintenance Team. Yeah, Tail 3 is our fleet leader, which means it has flown the most amount of times out of any booster. Uh, it's flown eight times, which is pretty cool. Um, Tail 2 is uh, right behind it. It's flown five times. Uh, Tail 2, we stopped flying it because we tested it. We did a really crazy test flight just to see how far we could push the booster, and it came back doing just great. And we have big plans for Tail 4. It's got 20 more missions left before the end of its life. And we plan on, on flying a lot of people uh, to space in those next 20 missions. Thanks so much, Roxy. Really great to hear from our team and to hear from students all over the world that are excited about the mission of Blue Origin and what we're doing with Club for the Future. Let's go back out to the rocket and see how it's doing on the pad.
We are standing by as the team continues to make sure that we are ready for our launch today here on NS23. We're going to go back to the rocket as we continue to hold. All right, our hold has been cleared and we are gearing up to launch NS-23, our New Shepard payload flight. We are going to get ready for the bit checks coming up next. There you see the launch gantry retracting. We're going to get ready for our built-in test checks, our bit checks, and make sure all of the subsystems on the rocket are ready to go. There you see the aft fins rotating. Those fins at the base of the booster help direct the vehicle on ascent and descent. There 
There you see the engine nozzle gimbling. Now that engine gimbals to help maneuver the rocket as it flies. We're also keeping an eye on the pressure and the temperature in the propellant tanks. Those need to stay in the start box or the green zone for all of these different variables. Everything looking good with the rocket. It is time to hand it off to Mission Control. Let's launch New Shepard. T minus 16, guidance internal. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. Two, one. Mission control confirms New Shepard has cleared the tower and is heading to space. Now you can see on the lower side of your screen that we're gaining speed as New Shepard gains altitude, the atmosphere gets thinner. The bar on the left shows the vehicle's ascent. Now we actually started at about 3,700 feet MSL. That's how far above mean sea level we are out here at launch site one. BE and free engine throttled up as we're going to push up to max Q. Again, that's the point where the aerodynamic stress on the vehicle is at its maximum. We're going to throttle back and then continue on up to space. It appears we've experienced an anomaly with today's flight. This was unplanned and we don't have any details yet, but our crew capsule was able to escape successfully. We'll follow its progress through landing. As you can see, the drogues have deployed and the mains are going to be pulled out next. So. There we go. 
All right, the mains are out. You see that they're reefed. They're going to be expanding. As the mains inflate, the capsule will stabilize. That's looking like a successful execution for the crew capsule and escape system. And the crew capsule continuing to descend under its three main chutes. You can see those West Texas mountains in the background. As we come down towards the desert floor, we're going to expect that retro thrust system to fire. Again, that will take out most of the energy in the landing in addition to the parachutes. You'll see it kick up a big cloud of dust out there in the desert. There goes the retro thrust system. You can see how our backup safety systems kicked in today to keep our payloads safe during an off nominal situation. Safety is our highest value at Blue Origin. It's why we built so much redundancy into the system. We're going to close out the webcast for today. We'll share more information about the flight on Blue Origin's Twitter feed as we can. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast.